While the children are being dismissed, let's lift our Bibles. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I thought the praise team did a wonderful job this morning. Give them a big hand, will you? Amen. Amen. Annie would be proud. And Annie and Brad, by the way, are on their way to the state of Washington, I believe it is. I believe that's where uh, Natalie is, right, Washington? And they're going to drive all the way out there, pick her up, and, and come all the way back. So pray for them, if you will. All right. She, Natalie's been working uh, all summer at a camp up there, so uh, they're excited about being able to have Aunt, uh, Natalie back home with them. We're talking here about healing broken families. Fellas, I'm just a little bit, just a tad louder than I would like to to be. All right. There we go. All right. Good. Talking about healing broken families. Would you agree that we have some broken families in our nation today that need healed? And the uh, fact, I may be talking to you today and that's okay. We've all been there. We've all had times where we needed something to take place. We needed Christ to do something in our family. And so we're talking today about how that words can actually go a long way in healing a broken relationship, a broken family, and all relationships, when we talk about words, I want you to think about this. Every relationship is built upon communication. Those words that we want to say, we, if we don't communicate them to each other well, then we could have a broken relationship. And any relationship that's not working usually is the result of somebody in the relationship who has stopped talking. Now, a lot of newlyweds discover this. When you're engaged, you talk a lot. You ever notice that? You talk a lot. And your relationship is great. And then you get married, and after a few months or maybe even a few years, sometimes the communication stops. Why does that happen? Well, you become busy, right? Sometimes too busy. And then you wonder... Well, what happened to this relationship? Why is our relationship stalled? Why is it we don't seem to be going forward? What, what's going on here? There's a problem. What is it? Well, it's something that we definitely need to learn today when it comes to relationships, and that is that communication is absolutely vital to healing any broken family and any broken relationship. This is something that we need to learn today in a country where, are you ready for this? 50% of all wives say, and I quote, my husband doesn't talk to me enough. Now, don't raise your hand, but we have any wives like that here today? All right. And did you know that in 86% of all divorces, those who are getting a divorce have made this statement, and I quote, one of the main major reasons for our divorce was we just couldn't communicate. Hmm. Well, I'm seeing elbows fly. It's fun from up here. It's, a, it's amazing. Did you know that one in four kids have said this? I've never had what I would call a significant conversation with my dad. Why does it always seem to be dad? Hmm. We obviously need help. Would you agree? And we need an expert. And no one is better at communication. No one is better than our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Word. He's the living Word. He is the ultimate in communication. So today, let's look to Him and see what He has to tell us about this thing of communication. And He tells us four different things. Number one, words that heal are words that build trust. They're words that build trust. You know, a family that uh, can't trust what you're saying or in your family, if, if, if anybody in the family has come to the place to where you can't trust what they're saying, there's no real communication. Think about that. I want you to think about this. If I were to say that 80% of what I'm going to tell you today is true, then how, how much longer would you stay to hear this sermon? I mean, 80%. I, I, that's a good percentage. Isn't that okay? You'd say, no, I want 100%. You want 100% in your family as well. You want to know that what's being communicated in the family is 100% true. If 
someone begins to lie, then in a few things, then you get to a place where you say, how can I trust anything that they've said? And if you inject any element of mistrust into your family, into the family relationship, it destroys all the communication because who cares what you have to say? They don't know if you're telling the truth or not. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, let your yes be yes and your no, no for what, now notice this, this is amazing, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Any time that you have to add anything to your yes or anything to your no, you get into the area where the devil lives. And you say, well, why did Jesus say that? Well, why is that from the evil one? Because the Bible says that the devil is a liar. You see, now, here's something amazing. In Jesus' day, the Jews had adopted a system of trust. They had developed this thing that that was that they all kind of know, knew just automatically was the way that you could trust somebody and what they said. And that's what Jesus was talking about here in this, in this passage we just quoted, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. The Jews, you see, the Jews were not allowed to swear by God's name. In fact, they had a law against that. You couldn't swear by God's name. You couldn't use God's name to swear by anything. But they invented their own system whereby they, would learn to, they could learn to trust each other. And here's how it went. The, the closer you got to God, the more a person could trust what you said. Now, here's what I mean by that. Some of them would say, I swear by the earth, God's footstool, that what I'm telling you is the truth. Well, that's pretty close. And so you could probably trust that guy. That, that's the way they thought. And then somebody else said, I swear by heaven, that's where God lives. Well, that's even closer to God, so you can really trust that guy. You said it's silly. It's, it's silly, some of the things we say. Remember when you were a kid? Cross my heart and hope to die. If, if what I, and some of you have added even more to that. If what, cross my heart and hope to die if what I'm telling you is not the truth. Remember that? And then when you get older, you just simply say, I swear it's true this time. I swear it is. <laughs> But Jesus has a better idea. And this is a better idea on your family. Jesus said, here's the way that you build trust. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Wouldn't it be a powerful thing if you could just ask your kid, did you eat those 15 cookies? <laughs> no. <laughs> I had 12. But anyway, I mean, <laughs> but wouldn't it be good if, if you could just ask your child something and they would just say yes, and you knew it was yes. When you start adding to it, it starts diminishing the yes. Do you get what we're saying here? So the more you make sure that everything you say is something that can be trusted, the better the communication you're going to have. Can you imagine how powerful it would be in a family if every husband knew that his wife always was telling him the truth. Every wife knew that her husband was always telling her the truth, and every parent knew that their child was always telling them the truth. And then the ultimate, every child knew that their parent was telling them the truth. You eat that watermelon, it's gonna, you'll, have, you'll have plants growing out your ears. We need to be careful about some of the things we tell our kids, amen? <laughs> now, there are four ways in which trust can be destroyed, though. And we want to look at those real quickly. Four ways that trust can be destroyed. So these, these are four things you want to avoid if you want trust to reign in your family. Number one, lies. That's, that's uh, obvious. But it's almost impossible to have a relationship with somebody who's continually telling you lies. You can't have a relationship with that person. You, you can never trust them. You never know if what, what they're telling you is the truth. And then number two, you may not have thought about this, but flattery. Someone's put it like this. Flattery is nothing but just a positive lie. Did you get that? And here's the dangerous thing about flattery. Flattery is designed to manipulate people. So when you get somebody that's just bragging on you just a little bit too much, you might want to be suspicious. You see, flattery is what people use to get people to do what they want them to do. It's a manipulative tool. 
So be careful about that. Number three, broken promises. And this is a big one. Whenever you break a promise, listen, whenever you break a promise with someone, you're breaking a trust. This person had a trust in you, and now you've broken a promise. And we're, parents, be careful what you promise your kids. When you break that promise, it breaks a trust with them, and it causes some doubt in their mind. And then number four, this may, may surprise you as well, silence. Just not talking at all. Not letting someone get to know you. And this is really bad in a family. Your wife should know you better than anybody else other than Christ. Your husband should know you, wives, better than anybody else other than Christ. Your children should feel like they know you. Take some time to tell them about yourself. Tell them about your background. Tell them why you do what you do, why you feel the way that you feel. You say, really? Really? It builds trust. It builds intimacy. It builds camaraderie. You can't have high-quality communication without high-level trust. Now, someone may be here this morning, and you say, Preacher, I hear you. What if I've already destroyed the trust in my relationships. How do I rebuild a foundation of trust? How do I start over? Here's the answer, my friend. You start over by building that relationship one word at a time. One yes at a time and one no at a time. And each time, listen, each time you're proven to be telling the truth, trust is slowly rebuilt. It can take a long time, but the relationship is worth it. Work on it. So to heal a broken family with your words, you have to build trust. Then number two, words that heal come from guarded thoughts. Words that heal come from guarded thoughts. Now here's what I mean by that. The Bible teaches that the way we think has a lot to do with how we communicate. What's really in our mind and our heart eventually comes out. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, for out, notice this, out of the abundance, did you catch that? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If there is an abundance of desires, an abundance of information, an abundance, abundance of concerns, that abundance is eventually going to run over and come out of your mouth. What you're concerned about, what you love, what you think about is eventually going to be spoken about. Now remember that. Mark 7:15 says, "There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come, notice this, out of him, these are the things that defile a man." It's what's in the heart. What's in, the mind? What's in the mind? And here's how it usually starts, by the way, when it gets messed up. You start with a wounded soul, and that wounded soul results in a bitter heart, and that bitter heart results in angry words. That's what usually is going on in a family. Someone's been wounded, someone's been hurt, and suddenly the abundance of things that are in their heart are things that are, that are hurtful. And hurt, hurting people hurt people. So I want you to think about that in your family. If that child one, one day just seems seemingly out of character, blurts something out to you that just seems out of character, then stop and ask yourself, I wonder what has hurt them. I wonder how they've been wounded. Take time to find out why this, all of a sudden, this outburst of hateful things. If your husband suddenly says something like that, find out what's going on. Ask, instead of getting mad, ask them, what's going on? Did I say something to hurt you? That needs to go on with every single person in the family. i never forget one time, uh, Tim came home, our son, and, and uh, just out of character, he just was blurting all these things. And it had been my practice in the past, uh, I'm ashamed to say it at times, to just come right back at him. But on this particular day, praise God, the Holy Spirit rescued me, <laughs> thank you, and said to me, just ask your son what, what, what went wrong today. And I said, Tim, what went wrong today? 
And he said, and he looked at me like, I can't believe you're asking. And he sat down and he began to share. And I thought to myself, my goodness, if I'd gone through that, I'd have been saying much worse than, than what he was saying. Learn to find out what's going on, especially if it seems out of character. No, we just usually, we, we're just, we're, we are, it seems like, geared to just come back before we even find out what's going on. You have to have guarded thoughts. You see, communication starts with what I think. And if I guard what I think, I'll talk in a better way. I've even gotten to, into the habits of, of when I go to bed at night, dear God, protect my dreams. Because Satan is, doesn't fight fair, and he loves to find you when you're, when you're unguarded. And when are you the most unguarded? When are you asleep? Some of you have probably awakened and said, why did I dream that? It might help if you went to bed tonight, at the night before having read some scripture and asking God to guard your thought so you can think about spiritual things. But good night if you've just watched 15 murders, 35 car wrecks, and, and 47 helicopters firing on 15 innocent people. What do you think you're going to dream about? <laughs> wow. Wow. Isn't it amazing? We Americans now have the ability to be exposed to more abuse and more violence and more negativity than any generation that's ever lived. And then we wonder why we have the thoughts we have. Wow. Guard your thoughts. We need to guard our thoughts and realize that if we think it, listen, eventually we'll say it. If you think it, you'll eventually you'll say it. And so guard your thoughts. Number three, words that heal come from someone who listens. Someone who listens. And there's no better example when it comes to listening than God himself. How many of you have found God's a good listener? He is. King David put it like this in Psalm 116, 12. I love the Lord because. I like that. David said, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. And more than some of us, look what it says. He has heard my voice and my supplication because he has inclined his ear to me. He not only heard me, but he listened to me. There's a big difference. How many of you know there's a big difference? Yeah, okay. You see, God listens to us every time that we come to him in prayer, but he wants us to be listeners also. He wants us to listen at, like he listens. But here's the problem. We're not exactly a nation of listeners. Have you noticed that? We are the most distracted uh, nation in the world. I've gotten to the point, and, and, and look, you, you know that I'm a sports fan. Oh, yesterday was sad. But anyway. <laughs> it happens. It's going to happen. But we are literally stalked by what's going on on television today. Becky and I were in a restaurant just the other night, and there were how many? Twelve televisions? There was, Becky warned me. She said, I just want you to know if I look beyond you, I'm not trying to look beyond you. There's a television right over your head. <laughs> There, I don't know, there were so many televisions that we would find ourselves in the middle of conversation trying to concentrate as best as we could with all of these things flashing all over this restaurant. We're not exactly a nation of listeners. We struggle with listening. It seems to be built into our culture. I want to, I want to read you an example. This column appeared in the Saturday, July 20th, 28th, 1990 edition of the Nashville Banner. Dear Ann Landers, remember her? Have you ever known a clam? Probably not. Well, I'm married to one. <laughs> wow. This husband of mine cannot or will not carry on a conversation. I've tried hundreds of times to get him to talk to me. It is impossible. Here's the way it goes. Me, what do you think about the government's plan to raise the price of postage stamps again? The clam. I have no idea. 
me. I read in the paper that there was a flood in the Sahara Desert, the clam. Oh, really? <laughs> His stock all-purpose comments are, is that a fact? Well, you can't win for losing. That's the way the ball bounces. Well, ain't that one for the books? His responses are a boring assortment of worn-out cliches and platitudes. Half the time, he tunes me out totally. For example, last night I said, I just got back from a trip on the space shuttle. He replied, that's nice. <laughs> Maybe it's genetic, not on his side of the family, but mine. My mother also married a clam. I remember one day, I remember one day when I came home after school, she was yelling, and I do mean yelling, at father. At my father, you never talk to me, she said. Something must happen at work that you could tell me about. He replied innocently, why are you hollering? What do you want me to say? Then he walked into the next room and plugged his eyes into the TV for the rest of the evening. When I asked my mother why she married him, she said, because he was the quiet type. <laughs> now I know what she meant, because I made the same Mistake. Can you imagine? Wow. <laughs> We're not a nation of listeners, but we need to be. I'm here to tell you this morning that I believe that, the, that a good portion of misunderstandings in families are all because of this. We don't really listen. We don't really listen. It seems like it is built into our culture. I, I like what Will Rogers said about Congress and I quote, Congress is so strange, a man gets up to speak and says nothing, nobody listens, and then everybody disagrees. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this morning, that's not just Congress, that's your family. Somebody says something, nobody listens, and then everybody disagrees. Does that describe your family? Now that's pretty much what it's like in our culture. Listening is not our natural preference. Most of us would rather talk than listen, wouldn't we? And because usually uh, we're thinking about what we're going to say next, don't raise your hand, but anybody have that tendency? Because we usually are thinking about what we're going to say next, the expert tell us that we only hear about 20% of what's being said to us. Wow. Think about that. It's funny, but it's also sad. If we're so interested in what we have to say, if, if, we, if we're just thinking about what we're going to say next, think about how many times you miss that important statement that your wife had to say. You missed that important statement that your husband had to say. You missed that hint at what was going on in your teen's life that you could have made, maybe you could have made a, a difference. But you missed it. Because all you could think about was, I have this, these jewels of wisdom, and if he or she would just shut up, I could share them. <laughs> no wonder sometimes our kids walk away from us going, I don't know what that was about, but I, I guess I'll try to do it. Isn't it amazing? And your husband, your wife, same thing. Proverbs 18, 13, I love this. It says, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. In other words, if you don't listen and you just go ahead and answer and you don't fully understand what was said, that's foolish. It's foolish. And you're going to be ashamed when you find out one day that all you had to do was listen. You didn't listen. Oh, it's so, this is so important to communication in our relationships that it's so important folks that we learn to listen as well as to speak. I've given you an acrostic there on your outline so listen carefully. This is how to some six things that will help you to improve your listening skills. Number one, look at people. Look at people. Look at people in their eyes. When you're talking to someone, look at them. Get your face out of the phone and the iPad and the book and the tele. You look at people. Listen with your eyes as well as your ears. Number the next one, I invest in people. When someone comes to you and says, 
I need to talk to you about something. It's very important. Whether it's your wife or your husband, your child, a friend, let them know, you know what? I'm listening. And I want you to know I'm listening because you're important to me and what you say. I'm right now, I'm going to invest everything I have in what you're saying to me because you are important to me. Let that person know. You, you will be amazed at how that will open them up to tell you exactly what's going on. And then the next one, stop. Stop whatever you're doing. Focus only on them. And if you can't focus only on them, get somewhere where you can. In fact, I'll be honest with you, nowadays, it may not be the best idea to go to a restaurant to have a conversation because you've got 15 televisions. Go somewhere where you can focus. Focus only on them and what they're saying. T, think about what they're saying. Don't try to guess what they're saying. Early on in my ministry is, is in my counseling. The Lord showed me, and praise God he showed me, and I'm still working on it today, but he showed me so many times I would hear somebody make one or two statements, and I'm all, I already have the remedy. I already have the answer, and I can't wait to give it. You know, most men are fixers anyway. We want to fix everything, right? And immediately, in fact, and I'm so grateful that I had two or three counselees who had the guts to say to me when I said, well, here's what you do. They looked at me and said, I don't really think so. That has nothing to do with what I said. And that startled me. And I said, oh, I must not. I said, well, then wait a minute. What were you really saying? And then when I stopped to hear what they were really saying, then later on, I had accurate advice because I heard what they were really saying and was not as much concerned about what I was going to say next. Think about that. Think about what they're saying. Don't try to guess what they're saying. Find out what they're really saying. And by the way, let me just share a few illustrations of how important this is. A church was having its monthly business meeting. Church finances were in better shape than usual, so the moderator asked if there were any special needs. One lady stood and said that she felt the church needed a chandelier. A penny-pinching deacon jumped up and shouted, I'm against it for three reasons. Number one, nobody would know how to spell it. <laughs> Number two, nobody would know how to play it. And number three, what this church really needs is more light. <laughs> and everybody said, amen. <laughs> All right, amen. Oh, one more, one more, and, I, and I'll leave you alone. A woman went to her pastor for marital counseling, and after a few preliminaries, the pastor said he had a few questions that would help identify the problem if she would just answer his questions as openly as possible. When the lady agreed... He asked, saying, do you have any grounds? The lady said, yeah, we have about 10 acres just north of town. No, ma'am, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, do you have, well, do you have a grudge? No, but we do have a nice little carport. <laughs> no, ma'am, said the pastor, that's not what I mean. One more question, does your husband ever beat you up? Beat me up? Oh, no, I get up before he does, just before just about every morning. <laughs> In complete exasperation, the pastor said, lady, you're not listening to me. Why do you have, or why are you having trouble with your husband? Well, <laughs> well, replied the lady, the man just doesn't know how to communicate. <laughs> Listen, amen? Listen, be careful what you're hearing. And then empathize. Empathize with them. Empathize with what they're feeling, go, feeling and going through. And don't ever say to somebody, well, you shouldn't feel that way. That's stupid. You shouldn't feel that way. Folks, feelings aren't moral or immoral. They're just feelings. And empathize with them. If they're feeling it, they're feeling it. It doesn't matter for crying out loud. And then, <laughs> and then notice body language. Did you know that one university study showed that 55% of a speaker's impact is in his body language? 
And so if you want to be an expert listener, learn to pick up on these visual cues. Learn that when somebody crosses their arms while you're talking to them, it usually means there's a barrier there. You're not getting across. Okay? Learn what it means when somebody says they're all right, but their eyes are downcast. Learn what it means when a person's jaw is set. It usually means yours is about to be broken. But <laughs> we need to learn to listen well. Amen? Number four, words that heal are empowering words. Words that heal are empowering words. Did you know that words are the single most important tool given to us by God? Think about this. What's more important than this? When Jesus Christ came, we're told he was the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why? Jesus Christ came and expressed to us in a way that only God in the flesh could what God is really like. That's how important words are. Words are the single most important tool given to us by God. In the book of Genesis, by the way, you find the story of Babel. And I want you to understand something about that story. The people were trying to build a tower that they might enable themselves to be like God. You say, what? To be like God? Yeah. They wanted to build their own kingdom, and they wanted to rule their own life. And so they thought if they built this large tower that they could not only be safe from the next flood, that was one reason why they wanted this tower so large and, and so forth, but they also could look into the heavens and worship other gods and empower themselves, selfish gods that would help them to be more like God and not be able, not have to fool with Jehovah and what he wanted. Well, needless to say, God despised their attitude, so he decided to halt their construction. And do you remember how he did that? Think about it. Did he take away their construction plans? No. He took away, listen, he took away their ability to communicate. You want to destroy, you want to destroy a community? Take away their ability to communicate with each other. Get them to the point to where everyone's screaming at each other and no one's talking to each other. No one's really listening. No one's empathetic. No one really cares. See how it goes? See how it goes? Look, look what's happening to us today. Do you see how important words are? Words really mean things. And they're so important. It's so important that we learn to use empowering words in our families, in our communities, yeah, in our country. He took away their ability to communicate, and the project crumbled. That's how important words are, beloved. And that's why our text today is Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. Edification is just a fancy word for building somebody up that it may impart grace to the hearers. When you're talking to your son or daughter, you're wanting to impart grace. You're, you're wanting to build them up as best as you can. When you're talking to your husband or your wife, same thing. Words are like a brick. You ever thought about that? Words are like a brick. You can use a brick to smash a window. Or you can use that same brick to help build a foundation for a building. What are you doing? Smashing windows or building foundations? Words can break a person's heart. Or they can build a person's life. I want you to think of the times in your, in your life that you've been changed by just a few choice words spoken at the right time. I think about many of you who have been in sports and, and that coach gave that encouragement to you. It caused you to go on to the next level. Or that teacher who encouraged you to go on to the next level. Or that grandparent who gave you advice and you followed it. Or maybe it was your spouse who shared some words of love with you that made you want to keep going forward. I want you to think about this. 
someone's put it like this, the five most important words are, you did a good job. The four most important words are, what is your opinion? The three most important words are, let's work together. The two most important words are, thank you. And the single most important word is, we. Think about that. And Jesus gives us four ways in which we can use our words to build people up. And here we go. Number one, be honest. Jesus was always honest in his communication. By the way, not everything he said was positive. Sometimes, you, sometimes what you need to say to your spouse, what you need to say to your children, what you need to say to mom and dad is not positive. It can't always be positive. Life's not always positive. But Jesus was always loving in the way he communicated, even, even if he had to commute something that, com communicate something that was not positive. Uh, and, by the way, the, here's something that's just as important. Honesty without love can be just as harmful as being dishonest. That's why in Ephesians 4.15, the Bible says, speaking the truth in love. Now, some people use truth like a missile. Anybody know, don't raise, don't raise your hand, but anybody know somebody like that? Some people use truth like a, a, a missile. They don't tell you the truth. They aim it at you. <laughs> know anybody like that? And then there are other people who are just thoughtless. Think about what you're going to say, beloved. Just thoughtless with what they say. Like, uh, oh, you do well for your age. I love that one. <laughs> or, I can't believe you did such a good job. <laughs> These are things that make you think later, was that really a compliment? <laughs> Listen to me. The truth hurts sometimes, beloved, but it doesn't have to maim, and it doesn't have to kill, and it doesn't have to destroy. Speak the truth in love. And if you can't speak it in love, shut up. Let somebody else take your place. Let somebody else get into the conversation. Maybe there are times when, you know, honey, you take it this time. I need to go off and pray. I'm just a little angry. Speak the truth in love. Honesty demands that we avoid flattery, and it demands that we avoid sugarcoating the issues. And when somebody needs to be rebuked and corrected, we must have the courage to tell them the truth. Telling the truth with a loving spirit is how you do it, but you must tell the truth. And we must tell the truth if our words are to have any power in them. So we need to be honest in our communication, and then we need to use touch. Jesus had a habit of touching the people he healed. Luke 5, 13, then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be, I am willing, be cleansed, and immediately the leprosy left him. Now, I want you to think about this situation in which this scripture is spoken. It was not socially or medically acceptable, of course, to touch a leper. And because of that, can you imagine how the lepers felt? They felt less than human. But Jesus affirmed this man's humanity and his worth when he reached out and touched him. Now I'm talking about appropriate touch. Of course, appropriate touch, please. <laughs> and in light of it, anyway, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but that's what we do when we reach out in appropriate ways and reinforce our words with a loving touch, just an arm around somebody's shoulder. I can't tell you what it's meant to me at times when I'm going through some trying times just to have somebody put their arm around my shoulder and, and say, Pastor, I'm praying with you and your family. But the arm around the shoulder tells me that, hey, you know, you're honoring me. You really care. A study a few years ago uh, used surrogate, what they called surrogate grandparents. I want you to think about this. 
This is, this is a true state, a real story. These grandparents were called in to these babies that lived in a shelter and had no, no parents, orphaned babies. And they were trained to give these babies massages. And so the grandparents came in, and they would massage the babies. And they found the results were astounding. The babies began to sleep better all through the night. They became more alert. They became more active, and they were more sociable with other babies. All because of the power of touch. But I'm not finished. They also found the grandparents benefited as well. They began to notice that they were making fewer trips to the doctor's office. They spent more time with friends. They reported less anxiety and depression. And they even the doctors discovered that stress-related hormones in their blood decreased. All because of the power of touch. When I pastored in Signal Mountain, Tennessee, I've told this story before, but it's, it made such a difference in my life. My daughter had, had to, I think she was about 12 or 13 at the time, and I was busy, and I didn't always take the time to, to give her a hug. I was headed down the hill, down the mountain one day, um, to the hospital, and I was listening to Dr. James Dobson. And he had on his program that day a fella, a man and a wife that work in New York City uh, with prostitutes, and they rescue prostitutes. They, they, they get prostitutes out of, the, out of the lifestyle. They pull up in a van, and they, they offer counseling. They offer a hot meal. Some of these young girls have not eaten. The, the pimps are so cruel and so forth. And then when they get them in the van, they tell them, if you're willing, we'll take you to a safe place now, and we'll, we'll rescue you out of this of this lifestyle, and they have rescued, and, and I'm, not, I'm sure there's another ministry that's continuing. This was way back in the, in the 80s. But they began to interview these girls and do a survey, and they, and they asked them, what led you to this point in your life to where you would allow yourself to be used and abused like this? And in a great percentage of the young ladies, they said, I just wanted to have a male touch. I just wanted a man's arms around me. I just wanted, and many of them said it like this, I just wanted my dad to hug me. My dad was aloof. He always looked at me and treated me as if I were nothing. This is what they often heard. Man, I made my hospital visit. I turned, I came back up, walked into my daughter's room, and I said, stand up. You're about to be hugged, and you will be hugged every day from this, this moment on. And, this, and even at this day, when we walk into the house, before my daughter says anything, I get a big hug. Folks, there's, a, there's the power of human touch when it's appropriate. So use appropriate and loving touch into communication. Ask questions. Ask questions. Questions have the power to challenge and clarify. Would you, would you write that down? Questions have the power to challenge and clarify. I want you to notice how Jesus used this. He challenged one of his close friends with a question, Mark 8, 29. He said to them, speaking to all the disciples, he challenged them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Folks, that's the greatest confession of faith found in the New Testament. And it came because Jesus challenged Peter with a question. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the key. Listen carefully. Statements... Statements tend to confront. Well, here's what I believe. Well, you shouldn't this. And nah. But a question says, why would you say that? Why do you believe that so-and-so is true? Could you give me an idea of, of what you're saying when you tell me that you believe that this is true? 
The minute you do that, you take the tension out of the air, you show respect to the person, and then thirdly, and most importantly, they get to clarify where they're coming from. You could scream at each other forever. I'll never forget one time I was arguing with someone, and finally I, the, the Spirit of God showed me, and I said, time out, time out. I said, we're saying the same thing. And I'll never forget the guy said, really? I said, yes, you're just using different words. I said, you're really frustrating me. I said, for instance, what are you really trying to say when you use that term? And he told me, and I said, see, that's exactly what I mean. That's what I believe. But if we hadn't got there, we'd, <laughs> we'd have still been screaming. Statements tend to confront, and often that builds barriers. But questions asked in the right way tend to challenge, and they can break through the barriers. Questions also clarified, like I just said, because when the person answers your questions, it helps you to know whether or not they understand what you're trying to communicate. Ask questions. Ask your teenager, why, why did you say that? What did you mean by that? Find out what they're really saying. Ask questions to empower your words. Let me end by saying this. Many, many times there are problems in families just because we're not listening or we're not sharing in a way that others can accept it. We're, we're using words like missiles. We're using truth. We're aiming it at people instead of sharing it with people. And then we're not hearing what the other person's saying, and so no wonder there are misunderstandings. I was counseling with a couple one time when they were telling me about their, their trip to a certain store. And one of them had gotten very angry about something. Uh, some, one of the, the, the husband had said something to the wife, and she said, what? And, uh, and then he said, well, I only went, and she went, and then he went, what? After we talked for about an hour, I said, wait, wait, wait. I said, let me ask you a question, sir. What were you trying to say? What were you really trying to say to her? And he said it, and she went, that's what you meant by that? And he said, yes. And she said, oh, okay. She said, well, the only reason I said what I said was because when you said that, I thought that you were meaning this, and boy, I was it. They had totally misunderstood each other. It was an absolute unnecessary fight. I wonder how many of those you've had. Simply because the words were fired at the person instead of sweetly said, and the Words from the other person were misunderstood because you didn't listen. Think about that. Think about that. Someone's put it like this. God wants you to listen more because that's why he gave you two ears and one mouth. Amen. Think about it. Think about it. Let's bow for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, as I bow my head before you today as pastor of this church, I pray for these families that I love so much and you love them more than I do. Oh, Lord Jesus, rebuke Satan. Rebuke Satan and anything that he would do to any single family that's a member of our church, especially those here today that have heard this. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take the word spoken today, that they'll take the outlines and that they'll actually use it. Change the way we think so that we'll change, we'll guard our thoughts and be careful how we say and what we say things and how we say them. Open our ears of understanding and give us a tremendous desire to really hear what our spouse is saying, what our children are saying. And then, dear Lord, above everything else, help us all to care what somebody's saying. Help us to really care. Oh, Father, I'm convinced that on our final day when we're 
about ready to leave this place and our families gathered around us and our friends. It won't be important what we own. It won't be so important what we mastered. What will be important to us is the things that have been said. Those sweet conversations around the campfire. Those wonderful expressions of love to each other when we shut out the entire world and just talk to each other. Those exciting and active times around the dinner table when everybody was excited to share their day and and the others were just as excited to hear it. Oh, Father, we're only taking two things to heaven, the Word of God and relationships. How sad it will be. How sad it will be for those who never really had, who perhaps never really had a real conversation. They live with a person for 30, 40, 50 years and don't know them. They raise their children and don't know them. They lived in a house with parents, but they don't know them. Oh, Father, give us all a craving today to really know our spouse, to really know our children, to really know our friends, and to really know our God. And Father, for those who don't know you today, I pray that the Spirit of God right now would grip their heart and show them that if they were just willing, just willing to admit their sins, to confess to you that they failed and trust Jesus Christ to come into their heart and life and forgive them and save them and be their Lord. They could have the most rewarding relationship anyone could ever know. Father, speak to all of our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand together and let's sing this old hymn.